Do you have thousands of important photos, videos, and documents scattered across your many devices or hidden away in shoeboxes? That is no way to preserve your family's history. Mylio Photos brings all your memories together in one place to be easily and safely organized and shared. To learn more about how Mylio Photos can help preserve your family legacy, visit mylio.com slash FTM. That's M-Y-L-I-O dot com slash FTM. Subscribe today and receive free gifts valued at $80. Your memories deserve Mylio Photos. Welcome to the June 2023 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. In this episode, we're talking about the release of the long-awaited 1931 Canadian census with Canadian genealogist Catherine Lake Hogan. Then in our Family History Home segment, Shamel Jordan is back. She's going to help you get ready for your next family reunion. And we are going to get a sneak peek of the upcoming issue of Family Tree Magazine with the editor, Andrew Cook. And he's going to be sharing some of his favorite tips for getting the most from his favorite genealogy websites. So as always, there's a lot to cover. Let's get to it. First up is Tree Talk. Rachel Christian is the social media editor at Family Tree Magazine, and she's back to take a look at what's trending in the world of genealogy. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. Hey, what are the genealogy news stories that you have your eye on right now? When this podcast is published, it will be June 1st, which means it's release day for the 1931 Census of Canada. I won't go on too much about it, though, because I understand there will be much more about the census uh, later on in this episode. Stay tuned for that. There is another release happening today, and that is Family Tree Magazine's annual list of the 101 best websites. Our 2023 list ran in the July-August issue of the magazine, and it was released online today. We publish this list each and every year to highlight the best online resources for genealogists of all skill levels. There will be a link in the show notes, and we encourage our listeners to go check it out and see what's new this year. Additionally, we publish a list of the 75 best websites for state-specific genealogy research each year. And this year's list includes websites for D.C., Puerto Rico, and other uh, U.S. territories as well. We're celebrating the release of both of these lists with a special giveaway. The prize includes a free one-year VIP membership, as well as a bunch of other website-themed genealogy goodies. So you'll be able to access all of our online articles for free with the VIP membership, as well as a digital subscription to the magazine and a whole slew of other prizes. There will be a link in the show notes to the giveaway as well, and a winner will be chosen on June 14th, so be sure to enter before then. Oh, how exciting. Somebody's going to really enjoy that. So June 14th, 2023 is the due date for entering the prize drawing. And people can kind of whet their appetite because we're talking to Rick Kroom in our Best Websites podcast this month as well about those lists. And boy, he found some good websites. So lots of things going on. Hey, thank you so much, Rachel. And we'll again have that link to the prize drawing and entry in the show notes. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Lisa. On June 1st, the 1931 Census of Canada was released, and this is an exciting collection that has a lot to offer genealogists. So here to tell us about it is Canadian genealogist Catherine Lake Hogan. She is the author of Family Tree Magazine's article called 11 Resources and Records for Canadian Genealogy. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Lisa. It is wonderful to talk to you again. It's been a couple of years, probably since we last crossed paths at a genealogy conference. It has, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you've been really busy with the whole release of the 1931 Canadian census. And in Canada, you have to wait a little bit longer than we even do here in the United States. So this is the most recent one available, right? 1931. It is. Yeah, we have to wait 92 years before the censuses are released to the public. So the 1931 had been locked away in a vault 
not accessible, the identifiable information on the census record has to be locked away. And we've been waiting. So it's been 10 years. It's been since 2013, since we've had a census release in Canada. And we are, we've been excited. It's great to have it available now. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what kinds of things that genealogists are going to be able to learn from the 1931 census. What are we going to see in that record? So there was a great big population, um, kind of a boom between 1921 and 1931, especially in the Prairie Provinces, um, the provinces out west. And There was a census taken of the Prairie Provinces in 1926. So they have a little bit of um, a jump on the rest of the uh, country and that they have that little bit of an extra information with that little census. And it was specifically taken, the 1926 census was specifically taken because of the population increase in those provinces. Canada, the Canadian government, really wanted to have those provinces settled. And since the late 19th century, they have been um, had been really working hard with their immigration efforts to settle the provinces. So in the 1920s, we had what was called the Empire Settlement Act, and that really encouraged people, especially from the British Isles, England, Scotland, Wales, even Ireland, to come and settle in the Prairie Provinces especially if they knew anything about agriculture, farming, that type of thing. Then in 1930, we had a different immigration act come in and there were some changes to that. And they were opening, they were again targeting people from Europe. And then we had the Chinese Exclusion Act was in in place. So when you look at the population of Canada between 1920 to 1931, It's predominantly British and French Canadian. That's the general makeup of Canada as a whole. Some of the demographics that we can look at or that you would want to look at, the statistical information on the census record has already been released. We didn't have to wait for that. It was already available. And even though you are looking at the population census records, the schedules for your ancestor, it's still worthwhile looking at that statistical data because it's it's giving you that little bit of extra information about the population as a whole. And I think there's 15 volumes. So the first one is the summary. And then you want to be looking at volumes one, two, and three. And volume three in particular is the ages of the population. And it breaks it down for you not only by age range, but it's also by province. There's a lot of um, tables in there, and it really breaks down that population by age and gives you an idea of the makeup of the country. So how much of the population was under the age of one? Well, it was about 1.9% of the population. And then how many people were living in a single household? What was the average number of people living in the family? And the average number was about 4.7 people. So between four and five people was the average makeup of a family in Canada in 1931. The tricky thing about the 1931 census was that it was happening in the early years of the Great Depression. So 1929, we had the uh, stock, stock market crash. It affected Canada as well. And 1933 was the peak of the Great Depression in Canada. So we're on that, I guess you could say, incline to the worst part of the, of the Great Depression, which was actually a decline <laughs> for everybody in the country and with massive, massive unemployment. And so the male population was a little bit tricky to enumerate because mm-hmm. The men are moving. They're trying to find jobs. So you have transients. People aren't where they thought they were going to be. So that could be a little bit tricky when you're trying to locate your male ancestors. And you might find your female ancestors and the children, but the man, the husband's not there. You can't assume that he's dead because he could be out looking for a job because unemployment was so high. 
Two other questions that are really, I think, are pertinent for the family history researcher. One is just of interest, and that is whether there was a radio in the home. That can give you some idea as to the prosperity of your family. Could they afford to have a radio? And radio was fairly new in that the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, um, was created in the 1930s. And I think it was just around the time of the census, maybe a little bit after. Now, we know that the census became available on June 1st of 2023, what should people do before they jump into it? Or should they just jump into it? Do you give them a little bit of advice on how they kind of prepare to then uh, dig into the records and get the most? And where will they find those records? Library and Archives Canada had a 10-step plan to have the census records released from microfilm to digitization, to having it released, and then to having it indexed and transcribed. And right now, so the the census images have been released. You can browse them on Library and Archives Canada for free. But you need to know, this is what you need to know. You're going to have to have some idea of where your ancestor was living. So you're going to need to know which province. And then you're going to know, need to know which registration district and sub-district. And that's where some of that statistical information can help you, especially for the Western provinces. Because those provinces were fairly new and the government really didn't know how to divide them up very well, they were given registration districts and sub-districts that really may not match up with the name of the place that they're living. So it can be a little bit confusing. Some of those registration districts and sub-districts are the same as they were in 1921, for that census. So that might be a clue to help you. So until we have the transcription and the index available, this is what you're going to need to uh, to do in order to research those and browse those images, those digitized images, is you need to figure out where was my ancestor living, try and locate the sub-district, and then you're going to have to do the old-fashioned way and scroll through the images to see what you can find. Well, you mentioned that some of the provinces, like some of the Prairie provinces, had a 1926 census. So we could, if you happen to be looking there, could we find those districts there as well? Probably. I'm I'm, I'm guessing they probably used yeah. the same registration districts and sub-districts in 1921-26, and some of them carried over to 1931. So some other places to kind of pinpoint where your ancestor was living, you can use city directories, you can use, now there was a federal election in 1935, and so that might help you pinpoint as well. You'd have to backtrack to 1931, but if you have an ancestor who registered to vote in the federal election for 1935, then that might give you an address and a location as well to help you backtrack to 1931 to figure out where they were living. Library and Archives Canada partnered with Family Search and Ancestry to have the census images, the digitized images, transcribed and indexed. And Ancestry and Family Search are using artificial intelligence in order to do this. So it should be much quicker. And it might, who knows, it might already be released by the time your audience is listening to our recording. Um, We don't know how fast it's going to be. It's certainly going to be much quicker than the old way of when we had volunteers manually transcribing that information and manually checking it, because it's all going to be done by artificial intelligence. It will be interesting to see how accurate the index is going to be. How well does the artificial intelligence read those names and transcribe them and index them? And how easy will it be for us to use that index? It's a really good point because in the 1950 census here in the U.S., in some ways it was much faster. In other ways, it introduced all kinds of new artifacts and 
errors, if you will, because the artificial intelligence is trying to read things. And if if a, a line or a page is a little skewed or whatever, that we'll be all watching very closely to see how that all turns out with cross fingers that that it comes out really well, because uh, you're right, it happens so much faster than if we had just human beings doing that indexing. So after it's been um, indexed and transcribed, they have to test it. So they're not going to release those um, indexes straight away. There's going to be some testing. We don't know how long the testing process is going to be. <laughs> so it may it may be faster than we think, but it may be also kind of slower than we think because they're not giving us any time frames about when this is going to happen. Because I don't think Family Search and Ancestry know how fast the artificial intelligence is going to be able to do mm-hmm. all this. Very good point. Well, before I let you go, do you have any other, there's probably just basic census search tips, maybe ideas on how to find somebody. And you you mentioned one really important thing, which was knowing the social context, which is men might be out looking for jobs and away from the house. So don't panic if we don't see them. Anything else that comes to mind that you think we should keep in mind as we're searching? Yes. Look and see if you have people who immigrated between 1921 and 1931 because of those immigration acts. I, for instance, have two grandfathers who immigrated to Canada in that time frame. So I'm really excited to see if I can locate them on the 1931 census. Make a list. That's what I'm doing is I'm making a list of the people on who I expect to find on the 1931 census. And then I'm also including where I think they were going to be living in 1931, just to kind of give me a point. Where can I start to track them down? Because where I think they might be and where they actually were could be two different things, but we have to start somewhere. Again, all the other tips about researching census records applies, name variations. Don't take everything on the census to be 100% accurate you know, you still have to evaluate all of that information. And most of all, have fun with it. I think you're going to find some interesting information about your ancestors. And who knows, you might find a surprise or two. Very wise words. And we've been listening to Catherine Hogan of lookingforancestors.com. And as Catherine mentioned, the 1931 Canadian Census is available at the Library Archives Canada website. Probably the simplest way to get straight to that page she mentioned with the whole process they've been going through and how they're tracking this is just to Google it. National, let's see here, Library Archives Canada, 1931 census. And that should get you there. You know, Catherine, I'm I'm excited because I have a little different scenario than a lot of people. My husband's great-grandfather had immigrated to Regina in 1912, but just after 1931, he goes back to England. So Interesting. It might be that the depression was weighing heavy on them. They weren't doing as well as they had hoped. And eventually he passed away in 1935. So this is my last chance to see him in Canada. So I'm very excited. Thank you so much for being on the show. Wonderful to see you again. Thank you, Lisa, for having me. Summer is family reunion season, and it's just around the corner. Well, Shamel Jordan has helped many family historians organize successful events through her webinars for Family Tree Magazine, and she's here now to help you. Hi, Shamel. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to have you here. And, you know, I was thinking, really, arranging a family reunion, it's like arranging any other kind of big family event, a wedding or an anniversary party or whatever. And there's so many things to do to get ready for hosting. Where do you suggest that people start? How do you kind of get organized in your planning process? Well, that is the most important thing to think of is that two cousins are better than one. (laughs) You absolutely never want to plan a reunion by yourself. In order to be successful, you really need to be inclusive and have the voice of others because Mm -hmm. by partnering with others is how you can really create successful reunion. So I would say the very first step is to establish a committee. Think about who those worker bee family members are when you have events, who are the 
people who are getting the word out? Who are the people who are um, encouraging other family members to come? Who are the people who might be event planners? Because like you said, reunions are, are very similar to any big family event. But I think reunions are actually a little like have their own thing going on because like a wedding, you know, everyone's focused on the bride and the groom. At the reunion, you're focused on your ancestors. And so that's a little different. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I like the idea of of having a committee, not just to get the help, but I imagine everybody knows different segments of the family better than others and kind of what they like and what they would be interested in. So you really get the benefit of what will draw everybody into the event. Exactly. And I would also suggest that anyone who's doing reunion planning, you have to go to Reunions Magazine. Reunions Magazine has an online magazine now that's free. And any resource that you could possibly think about, and this isn't specific to family reunions, it's reunions in general, but they are like the center of information about reunions. And the other place, Online Family Reunion Institute, which I am a part of, um, we have workshops and provide a lot of information online that can help you. So that's another way to get started, to see what you're getting yourself into. (laughs) Excellent. We'll have links in the show notes page for those two resources. And, you know, you were talking about kind of pulling things together. Do you have any favorite tools that you use to stay organized and work on this project? So there are tools for yourself and then there's tools for the family um, where you can kind of collaborate. So think about it as any other project. What kind of tools do you use for your projects. And what I favor right now, and it's always changes, are note takers, um, like uh, Evernote or OneNote, where you can have different tabs for different aspects of the reunion. And I also like having something like um, my family, we use Google Docs. We have a Tumor Family Reunion email address, you know, tumorfamilynj at google.com. And so that gives us access to all of the full Google world. So we have a drive where we can save mailing list and um, things that we would want family to collaborate. Excellent. They can all have access to it. Yes. So I think a big part of, you know, a successful event is obviously we want people to show up and (laughs) it's almost like you have to have a marketing campaign. Do you have some ideas or strategies for how you go about marketing to your family to get them excited and most importantly, committed to attending the event? This is absolutely the number one question that people ask, how do you get family involved? And it is such a difficult question to answer because every family is unique. What happens in what might work in one family may not be as successful in another family. So you really establishing the committee to really get into the vibe of what your family would be interested in is the beginning of marketing, right? The second is to, I would say, is to meet them where they are. We have a Facebook group that lets people know what's going on. We had a website that let people know what's going on. We have a newsletter using MailChimp. MailChimp is free up until I guess like a thousand people. And um, we don't have that many people on our mailing list, but that's an effective way for people who aren't on Facebook. You can't just set up Facebook. You have to set up multiple ways. Another way, church announcements. My family, big family, we go to many different churches. If possible, you can get it into church announcements. And so your planning committee, word of mouth is the number one way as far and always the activities. And let me just tell you, I just learned a tip that I think is brilliant from people who come to our workshops. That's what's so great about the Family Reunion Institute is people come and learn from us, but we also learn from them. These sisters have been giving reunions regularly, 
And they said one of the ways they get people to show up is to give activities or give tasks to the youth. So have, if you know someone plays the piano or if you know some other child does, you know, whatever it is, whatever their talent is, set it up so that the parents have to bring them. (laughs) And so then the parent has to show up. And I think that is absolutely brilliant. And they said it works for them every year. I think that's totally brilliant. What parent isn't going to want to come if their child's going to get a chance to, to perform or do something, share their talents? Oh my gosh, that's a wonderful idea. And you know, I, I love if you are fortunate enough to have a repeat reunion. I know some families do it every year, every other year, every five years you know, do a little compilation video at the end of the previous one and use that as your marketing tool oh my on your goodness. Facebook and, you know, your website. Yes, I, We do that. We put up the pictures each year. We take um, yes. group pictures. And so we like to put those up. You're absolutely right. Well, it not only refreshes their memory, but it also gets people excited who didn't come last time to realize <laughs> that they're missing something. <laughs> I love these ideas. Okay. So I guess before I let you go, I want to make sure I check in and how do we incorporate family history at the event itself? Do you have some ideas on activities that we can do that help the non-genealogist in our family actually learn a little bit more about their ancestors? So I want genealogists to realize that without you, there is no family reunion. At the Family Reunion Institute, we say a reunion without family history is just a picnic. (laughs) <laughs> so if you're not involved, it is just a picnic. So reunions are important for you. So there's so many different ways to do this. And of course, having a presentation that speaks to them, not one that you would give at a genealogy conference, right? <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to know how the sausage is made. They just want the story and the juicy documents and the pictures, Also, each year, just try to produce something written. Our program has something that's written on it every year, a small historical fact. We like to do journals, family journals that include, one year we included a short biography of everyone 75 years or older that was living. We did one year, we did the biographies of all of our main ancestors Calendars are great. The years we did calendars, we did all family members living and dead. So that was kind of interesting to see, you know, your past ancestors you shared a birthday with. Certificates of ancestry. Um, My family took DNA tests of our oldest so that we could see the Y and the mitochondrial. We used a design um, program to create a certificate of ancestry from the people that we all share, the why and the mitochondrial. And so that was actually became a fundraiser because we framed them and we sold them. Your t-shirt, Lisa, can be family history. Mm -hmm. Um, The names of who the progenitors are and who the, in their pictures. So there's so many different ways you can do this. Storytelling, we have storytelling contests. I could go on, figure out what your family likes to do. My family likes to eat and tell stories <laughs> so, and take pictures. <laughs> and so we have a lot of that going on at the reunion. That sounds like fun. Oh, gosh. I know I'm excited about maybe uh, putting one together, and I hope our listeners will be as well. You can learn more about Shamel Jordan and the work of the Family Reunion Institute. Uh, we, again, we'll have links in the show notes for that. And uh, Shamel, is there any other place that you'd like to have folks stay in touch with you? Almost definitely genealogyquickstart.com. Check out the website. Absolutely. And all your great videos. Thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful ideas. There's going to be a lot of really fun reunions this year, I can bet. Thank you, Shamel. Thank you. As we wrap up this episode, let's swing by the editor's desk and check in with Andrew Cook, the editor of Family Tree Magazine. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Lisa. I see that the July-August issue of Family Tree Magazine is coming up. What can we look forward to in this issue? Every year, our July-August issue has our list of the best genealogy websites. So we've been doing this 
every year since clear back to 2000. I think our first list was in April, <laughs> April 2000 issue. So quite a few things have changed since then. And, you know, we pull together all the different resources from the ancestry.com mega websites down to sort of the mom and pop genealogy shops. And they're sorted into categories, which is really helpful, different tech tools, different websites for European research and, and so on. And we also have been including our list, our state by state list of the best websites for US research. So best websites for Ohio, for Texas, for Kentucky, you know, wherever, whatever US state or territory you're researching, we've got a website listed there for you. There are 19 websites on this year's list that were not on last year's list, including the Family Curator, which is the blog of our columnist and podcast guest, Denise Levinick, the Virtual Genealogical Association, and Archive Grid, which is a website that helps you track what different archives around the country have, which can be a helpful resource. And we're announcing the list the same day this ep- this podcast episode goes live, which is June 1st. So you can go to the show notes or to familytreemagazine.com and just hit the best websites tab on our main menu to find a full list of the site and with clickable links to the the actual honorees. That's terrific. And I know when you put it on the website, you actually have like a, a little menu category thing that so you can jump down to the state that you want, right? Yeah, yeah. For the best state websites, we have a drop down and it'll filter out just, you know, if you just want to see the sites for Alabama or Arkansas, you can do that. And it uh, makes it really easy to navigate. Fantastic. And we're having uh, Rick Kroom, our best websites podcast this month as well, right? Yep. So our listeners can look for that in their feed and he's going to talk about talk about that list. He's the one who's, who puts it together. Excellent. One thing that I'm always struck by as I um, work through the best websites article is how each of the different sites sort of has its own nuance. You know, they all work a little bit differently and to get the most out of each, it's good to take some time to learn how they work and to, to get the most out of them. We have some free video tutorials for some of the sites that we'll link to on that best websites landing page, or you can look at for each site's FAQ or about the site sections, because a lot of them will have really helpful how-to information with sort of insider tips to understand what the site can do for your research. Yeah, that's a good investment of time, actually, (laughs) because it can save us a lot of headache when you're trying to work with a new website. This list is bringing several new ones to us to make sure that we're using it correctly, because even though most websites have a search engine, they all work a little differently. Um, Well, that's terrific. I I really enjoyed talking with Rick Kroom. He's always got his radar on terrific new websites and and what's new on the the ones we've known about for a while. What are some of the other highlights of this upcoming issue? The July-August issue also has a roundup of different mobile apps for scanning photos and documents. Rick Kroom actually wrote that as well. We also have tips for using the Family Search Family Tree as a research resource in and of itself, as opposed to just a place to store your family information, as well as a Polish genealogy cheat sheet. Fantastic. Well, that's the July, August 2023 issue of Family Tree Magazine on newsstands. And then I assume it will follow up on the website as a digital issue as well. Yep. You can look for it on newsstands beginning on June 27th. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for the update. We'll, We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so glad you joined me for this June 2023 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. It's the show from America's number one genealogy magazine. And as always, I'll have links for you over at the show notes page to everything that we talked about today. You can find our show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. But wait, because we've got even more genealogy for your ears over at our best websites podcast. And this month, Rick Kroom is running down his favorites from our latest best websites list. You can find Family Tree Magazine's best websites podcast in your favorite podcast app, just like you found this one. Thanks again for joining me today. I am Lisa Louise Cook, and you can visit me over at my website, genealogygems.com. There you will find my Genealogy Gems podcast and a link over to the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. So until next time, have fun climbing your family tree.